So we are going to be looking at uh, initial values of circuits that have switches. That's the easiest thing. Instead of talking about square waves where you have pulses that turn off and on, we'll have a physical switch that we'll be looking at and that will effectively guide us as to what's going on. So here we go, let's get started. So what we are doing here is that just to make sure that we're all speaking the same language, when we say T equal to zero minus, this is before switch is thrown. So when I say thrown, it could be open or closed. And of course, T equals to zero plus is after. Switch is thrown. And like I tried to say in lab, this section, even though I will not test you on it specifically on this topic, it will be on the next exam, we will have four problems. Of those four problems, all four of them are gonna involve this section. So this is an important section, okay? Because it, it literally is gonna show up again and again and again. So what we're doing here is that we're gonna be doing what? We will be deriving the initial conditions for first and second order differential equations. So in circuits, they're known as first order circuits and second order circuits, but we need these initial conditions here. So let's talk about first order. So I said a, a lot of this in, um, in, in the, the piece by slab, but I think we should still keep doing this. So if I say a first order circuit, what that really means here is that I'm gonna be talking about an RC or an RL circuit. And what we're going to be doing here is that when solving a first order differential equation, there is one arbitrary constant, right? And when we're talking about arbitrary, that means it's undefined. And what we really mean by this, this is really an integration constant. That's the easiest way to talk about it. Okay, it's an integration constant. And so which, what we find here is that in order to make this a real solution, what we do here is that we end up with the circuit like this. where our job here at zero minus is to have some constant. So we need that X of zero minus for that constant. And so, but um, nature has been kind to us, right? Has been kind because we can solve for the capacitor voltage or the current of the inductor before the switch is over. And, and what we find here is because these guys cannot change instantaneously. Right, they cannot change instantaneously. 
So what that really means here is that we already have VC of zero plus and IL of zero plus. And that's the beauty of this thing. Because we know that VC of zero minus and VC of zero plus are the same. And we know that IL of zero minus and IL of zero plus are the same. So then we get to second order circuits. So when I look at second order circuits, instead of one, thought I deleted all the stuff from office hours, I think I did. What we find in second ordered circuits, instead of one integration constant, we have two, right? So we have two constants that we got to deal with. So what we're seeing here is that second order differential equations have two arbitrary constants. And for the sake of simplicity, I'll just call them A1 and A2. And so what we're doing here is that you're going to find that that's kind of a white lie that differential equations teaches you. That if you have a differential equation, that is true, that you do get two arbitrary constants. But what I'm going to say here, this is miss. misleading and not true. And you may say like, well, that, that's, I, you know, of course mathematicians know what they're doing, but what I wanna give you a sense of here is that I wanna sort of like break it down. But what do I mean by this? Well, the two constants that we have here look something like this. So if you have A, dx dt plus b dx dt plus cx, and this is gonna be some constant d. What this tells us here is that the two constants that people typically talk about, let's call this a1, and then I could have a second constant because it's a derivative of this guy, which I'll call a2, that is true, that mathematical Right? So mathematical differential equations really do only, really do only require, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, really do require these two constants. but not real ones. Real differential equations, no. So if you look at circuits, for example, here we go. So, so as an example here, what you'll find here is that in one of these cases, um, there is a minimum of three constants, not two. And you might be saying, how could that be? Well, let's say here. So suppose... Suppose... We have an RLC circuit where 
we solve for VC of T. So what does that mean? Well, the initial conditions imply we need VC of zero plus and the derivative of VC at zero plus. But there's a problem. When solving for dv dt, this depends on the inductor current initially. Therefore, we need di of zero plus. So what this implies here, we are required to have three constants. In other words, bc of zero plus, il of zero plus, and dv zero plus dt. And this is only assuming that the geometry of the circuit is, um, is simple enough. But what you're gonna find here is that in more complicated RLC circuits, or you have a CCR or an LLR circuit, what you typically find, we need four initial conditions, not two. And the reason why that is here is that what you find here is that in these circuits, dv of zero plus, dt, and di of zero plus, dt, are coupled into two equations and two unknowns. So what that means here is that you really get something like this here. So one of the equations that you'll find here, literally they'll be in two equations. For example, you'll get, so you'll get something like, like A1, dv zero plus dt plus b1 di zero like this. So you're seeing here is that you can't isolate you can't isolate it. You need di you know at zero plus dt. And so what you find out that you do here is that you generate a second equation. So you get this guy like this. So now you have two equations and two unknowns. And so what this requires here is that so what we say then is that what this tells us here, we are required to have 
four constants or four initial conditions. So in this case, it's gonna be VC, IL, DV, DT, and DI zero plus DT. So what you're finding here is that these initial conditions really play a role and these are things that I'm, we're just gonna have to work through in this course. We're gonna have to, and I'll try to teach you to the best of my ability of how you deal with these things. So now, what do we need to do here? What we gotta do here is that we need to come in and we really need to how to, how to deal with this process here. Okay, so what we wanna look at here is that we wanna look at the process of deriving initial conditions. Okay, so what we can say here very safely here is that the first thing that I wanna say here is that we can only use simple circuit techniques. Using KVL and KCL, that's it. Now, at times, it's helpful to think, you know, series, parallel, and node mesh thinking. And you just can't use them, but I think it's important that you set it up so that one can start to look at this thing. So this type of thinking is very, very helpful in really approach for how it is done. So what you're gonna see here is that as a rule of thumb, initial conditions that we will encounter will require um, will require two equations for RLC type circuits. And what I mean by that is that, that what we're gonna do here is that we're going to apply ACL to relate IL of zero plus to IC of zero plus, which is of course C dV dt of zero plus. So if I need the derivative of the um, capacitor, that means we really got to connect these two currents. And if I do the same kind of thinking here, KVL, and what we're going to relate here is that we're going to relate VC of zero plus to VL of zero plus, which is of course equal to L D I D T. So we're trying to relate these kinds of things here. So what we want to do then is that we're going to be only using simple circuit techniques using KVL and KCL. That's like 99% of the process. At times we should be thinking about series in parallel or med and no med and no and mesh thinking, but remember 
we can't use Mesh or Node anymore. That's we're effectively done for that for the semester till we get to complex circuits here. Okay. So since our primary goal So our goal in this chapter is to determine VC, IL, DV, DT, and DIL, DT, There are three things to consider. So the way we typically do this here is we do the following thing. First thing that we do is that capacitors slash inductors always control the circuit. So what we do here is that our primary goal then is to go and solve for VC and IL. Is to first solve for either VC or IL of T. And then go back to the original circuit with this information. And then at that point, we just use simple circuits to solve for the desired parameters. Another thing that's, that we already know here is to, we usually can easily solve for VC of zero minus and IL of zero minus. But we are only interested in what happens after the switch is thrown. Okay, only after. So what this tells us here is that I could then come in here and I could just say, which is something that we already know, but I want to be very systematic. And that VC of, of infinity is equal to an open. And IL of infinity is equal to a short. That being the case, once these values, right, these guys right here are our steady states. Once we have these steady states, we then go in and replace them in the circuits that we're looking for. Okay. And so the last thing that I want to say here Once the switch is thrown, the circuit determines what happens to VC of T and IL of T, right? 
And what we're finding here is that what we're going to see here is that I C of zero minus I C of, of zero plus are usually, right? And VL of zero minus and VL of zero plus are usually not continuous. Right? It's not continuous. And because they're not continuous, we expect these guys to be different. And so what you're going to find here is that resistors in series slash parallel with caps slash inductors will exhibit this continuities too. And you're going to see that that's kind of, that is the norm. So what I want to do here is that just to highlight some of the things that I'm talking about, I want to go in and I want to look at some examples. Okay. I have three examples. I'll start off with a two order, a second order circuit. I'll go to a one order circuit. Then I'll go back to a two order circuit. So I'm going to try to sort of like stage these and uh, difficulty here. So here we go. So as an example circuit, I want you to think about a circuit that looks like this here. So I have a circuit that looks something like this. Okay, so if I've just given some values here, here's what I have. And what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna close the switch at T equal to zero. And then we're gonna ask the following questions here. I wanna, I want to determine VC of zero plus, IL of zero plus, and then VC of zero plus, DT, and DI of zero plus, DT. So I want to determine these guys here. So let's go look at that. <coughs> so the first thing that I want is that I want to start off with what? the initial steady state. What does that mean? Minus infinity up to zero minus, which I then define as T equal to zero minus. And at the initial steady state, what we say here is that the cap and inductor are in steady state. So what that means here is that before the switch is thrown, the cap and the inductor have now reached steady state so that I can replace them with an open and a short. So here I go. So then I have a circuit that reads like this. Right, so I replace them with an open and a short, and you can see here that there is no 3K because it's open, so that's a dead resistor, 
So then I have a second resistor here. So this guy's a 6K. This guy's a 6K. And when you're looking at this thing, you could see that the inductor current is in series with the 6 ohm resistor. And the capacitor voltage is parallel to the 6K resistor. So now what I want to do here is that I want to determine um, IL of zero, excuse me, and VC of zero plus. So if I do that, you can see here, you know what, I said plus, I really mean minus because we haven't made that assumption yet. So then you could see here that the voltage across the 6K at zero minus is the same as the voltage of the capacitor at zero minus. So using VDR, you could see here that this guy's gonna be what? I have two resistors in series. So I'm gonna get six plus six, six times the voltage. And if you compute that, I get a value of what? Well, I get a value of six volts, right? So this tells me that I get six volts. We don't care about the minus. All we care about is the plus. So therefore I get my initial voltage of the capacitor. So when I look at the inductor, now that I know that this guy here is six volts, we could see that the inductor current in this case is then going to be the current through the 6K resistor. But if I have six volts across the 6K resistor, then according to Ohm's law, I should have one milliamp for the inductor current like this. So now I have two of those initial conditions. So what I'm gonna do now is that now the switch is thrown. The switch is thrown. So I had I start off with my initial steady state. Now the switch is thrown. And what do I expect here? There is now current running through the cap and there is a voltage across the inductor. So what I do here is that I redraw my circuit now. So if I redraw my circuit, this is what I see here. I now have to include that 3K resistor, but look what I'm doing. I draw the capacitor. I draw the inductor. So that means here is that even though I know the voltage of this guy at zero plus, I now know that there's a possible current that has to follow this way. Carlos? Yeah? Is, uh, is the one milliamp equals IL zero minus? Is that supposed to be IL zero plus? Yes. And then if I look at the inductor, we know what the inductor current is because that cannot change over time, but its voltage can change instantaneously. So what you're finding here is that you have constraints on how the voltage of the capacitor, excuse me, the current of the capacitor and the voltage of the inductor can behave because it's the rest of the circuit that cannot change here. So here we go. So now let's physically look at the circuit here. So what do I know here? So for the inductor, 
at t equal to zero plus, that tells us that the current of the inductor in this scenario here must be what? One milliamp, it can't change. But what this tells us here is that this is in series with the 6K resistor. If it's in series with that, we could then say here, oh man, I made a mistake. Ah, I made a silly mistake. Check this out. I got to go back here and erase this thing. I forgot to include the 3K resistor here. And the inductor current is still flowing here. But it looks like that here. So what you're seeing here is that this combination of a resistor here tells us that that has to be what? Six parallel to three, that's one half. So I divide by three, this is really a 2K. So this is really in series with what? Uh, the 2K resistor of six and three in parallel. So what does that tell me here? Well, <clears throat> if I have one amp that's flowing through here, then really what I'm seeing here is that I have my 2K resistor. And of course I have what? I have one milliamp flowing in this here because that's what the inductor is. And you could immediately see that the voltage across the uh, 2K here must be two volts, okay? So I know the 2K has two volts across that. So what you're seeing here is that now to determine the voltage of the inductor, apply KVL around the right loop. And what you're seeing here is that I have this. I have my cap, which that cannot change voltage. And that voltage we already know is uh, six volts. We have the inductor, and then we have the two ohm resistor here, or the 2K, excuse me. And what was the cap equal to? I forgot. I think it's equal to two microfarads. So then I have two microfarads, and then this guy is the voltage of the inductor at zero plus. Okay, and we just computed that we know what this voltage here, this voltage of the 2K, we saw was two volts. So if I apply that KVL, you could see here, making my loop, let's say, go in this direction, what you're seeing here is that now I could see that I can write that VC, right? So if I go along, I'm gonna get plus, plus, minus, so this tells me here is that VC of zero plus must be VL of zero plus plus the voltage across the 2K at zero plus, of course. So if you're looking at this guy, you can see here is that I can get the voltage of the, of the inductor here, which will then be, of course, what? VC zero plus minus V2K at zero plus divided by, well, I haven't divided it by anything here. So, but then you could see here that this value here has to be what? Six minus two, it's gonna be four volts, but L D L D T, you know, is equal to the difference between these guys is equal to four volts. So that tells me here is that DL, DT, then must be four volts divided by L, but L they tell us is what? It's one millihenry. So then this gives me 10 to the negative three henrys. 
and you could see that this guy becomes 4,000 amps per second. And that's what DL DT is. So now I have my third initial condition. So now if I go back to my circuit here, I can now look and I can apply here. Let me, let me define my node right here. Maybe I should just take this with me so it's easier to interpret here. So now what we wanna do here is that we wanna determine IC of T slash DV of T DT. So when you're looking at this thing, here's what my circuits look like. So if I'm looking at the current and I'm gonna focus on this node right here, okay? I'm gonna focus on that node. Well, for starters here, we know that this green node right here has to be the voltage of the capacitor. So this guy is really VC of zero plus, which is six volts. So what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna apply KCL at the green node. So if I do that, you could then see that I have the source current at, you know, at, that, at that node right there, the green node here. What am I seeing here? Well, I have the source current coming in. And then I have IC, then I have IL going like this. So this tells us then that what goes in has to go out. This, this implies then that this is going to be IC then has to be the difference between these two. And if you look at this guy, that means here that I'm going to get IS minus IL. So what is IS? Well, if you look at that, it's got to be the difference between what? 12 minus VC divided by 6K, whereas IL, we already know, is 1 milliamp. And you could see here is that this guy is going to give me what? Well, I know VC 0 plus is 6, so I'm going to get 12 minus 6. Actually, I'm going to move this over here a little bit so I can spread it out a little bit better. So then I'm going to get 12 minus 6 over 6 minus 1, which is, of course, 0. So that means here that IC is 0. However, we're not interested in IC. We're interested in C dV dt oops, at 0 plus dt is going to be equal to 0, which then, of course, tells us that dV dt is then 0. And that's kind of the way we, we, we can look at these circuits here. So what I want to do here is that I want to look at a, a simpler circuit, but something along these lines here. And here we go. So let's look at this example. It says, assume steady state has occurred when the switch opens at t equal to zero. Determine all the voltages and currents for all elements for t equal to zero plus. Okay. So if we want to go look at this guy here, we want to go in and we have to look at really two stages, the steady state, the initial steady state, and then we need to go in and we want to look at what happens after the switch is thrown. So 
what we can do here is that we want to look at the initial steady state. Okay, so let's look at this initial steady state. So the first thing that I see here is that the switch was closed. So that means that we're looking at t equal to zero minus, the switch was closed, so then I have what? I have a 12 volt source. I have a three ohm, and then this becomes open. And then the inductor behaves like a short and And it looks like this. So this is a 6 ohm. This is a 3 ohm. And what we're seeing here is that this guy is PC of 0 plus. And then the current, ooh, I should not be saying 0 plus. Should be saying 0 minus. And then, of course, I have this inductor that looks like this here. Well, what am I seeing here? Well, when I look at this thing, there's only one loop. <coughs> there is one loop. What we're seeing here is that the current of the three ohm, which is equal to the current of the inductor, To six. Must be all the same because they're in series. And so if I use Ohm's law, we could see here is that I have two resistors in series with the voltage source here. So I could then say that the current of the all of these guys here, what I'm going to use here is I'm going to use Ohm's law. So if I use Ohm's law here, we could see here that this has to be 12 volts divided by 3 plus 6 ohms. So therefore, I'm going to get 4 thirds milliamp. And this is the inductor current here. At 0 minus, but is also the same at 0 plus. In a very analogous way, we could see here that the voltage of the cap, right? The voltage of the cap at zero minus is the same as the voltage of the six ohm at zero minus. So if I know what the voltage is across this guy, which I do, which would be six times I L L I L zero plus, then you're gonna see that I'm gonna get what? I'm going to get 6 times 4 over 3, which that gives me 2 times 4, which gives me 8 volts. And that guy has to be the voltage of the cap. So now I got both my initial conditions. Now the switch is thrown. And as soon as the switch is thrown now, So now I put the capacitor and the inductor back into the circuit. So if I put them back into the circuit, what do I actually see here? Well, the 12 volt source is now gone, right? Because now we have an open in the circuit and you could see here that this three ohm resistor is really a dead resistor So the question is, what do we know about the capacitor? Well, we know that it has an initial voltage of eight. So I come in here and I put the capacitor symbol back into the circuit. And I know its voltage cannot change. And it's eight volts. And the other thing that we know here is that the inductor goes back into the circuit 
And this guy has a voltage drop of VL of zero plus. And so when I look at the circuit here, I have this resistor. And this resistor, of course, is a six ohm resistor. However, I do know that the current of the inductor is looking like this and the current of the cap is looking like this here. So note the direction of the current through the capacitor. It's a passive element. The current always has to enter into the, um, in from the positive end and out the negative end. So let's look at this thing. So I can see here is that I3 of zero minus, we already looked at this and look at this. I have three milliamps, but now look at I3 of zero plus, this guy is zero milliamps. Look at what happened. Instantaneous change. Okay, there's an instantaneous change. Capacitors and inductors cannot change. Their value is instantaneous, but resistors can. That's what I mean by that. And now let's go look at the six ohm resistor here. So when I look at the six ohm resistor, since the inductor and six ohm resistor are in series, the voltage of, or, or current of the re six ohm resistor cannot change here. So when I'm looking at this guy here, what we're seeing here is that because they're in series, this value will not change. So in other words, I expect that 6L of zero plus is proportional to, excuse me, I said I6 is proportional to zero plus of L. So then I would expect here that this guy of six will not change either. And it should stay at four thirds milliamp. And then of course, that must be true here, which then implies here that the voltage of the six will stay at eight volts too. Okay, so I got the two resistors. So now let's go look at the capacitors and the inductors. Well, of course they can't change, right? They can't change. However, the capacitor current can change and the voltage of the inductor can't change. So here we go. So what we did before here is that we looked at this node right here. So if I look at the green node, what do I wanna do here? I now wanna go focus on, let's say, the voltage, or excuse me, the current of the cap. So if I apply KCL at the green node, what do I see here? Well, at this node, what we're seeing here is that if I look at KCL here, what do I see? Well, I see this here. I see that the inductor current is going like this. And this guy's four thirds milliamp. Then I see the capacitor current going like this here. And what we're seeing here is that if I apply KCL, then the current in has to be the same as the current out. In other words, what I have here is that I have that IC of zero plus plus IL of zero plus must be zero. In other words, IC of zero plus must be negative of IL of zero plus. So remember, all I'm doing here is that I'm applying KCL. So then this must be minus four thirds milliamp IC 
of zero plus is then this value right here. Let's go look at this thing here. Just to remind you, look at what I, look at this. I see of zero minus was what? Zero. Look at this. This changed instantaneously. Just as expected. Now let's go look at the voltage of the inductor here. So when I look at the voltage of the inductor, I want to apply KVL. So note that I have one loop only. So you could see that the voltage of the inductor plus the voltage of the 6 ohm must be the same as the voltage of the capacitor. So if I apply, so applying KVL around the loop, and if you're asking what loop, remember there's only one loop. So then what I'm seeing here is that this is what this loop looks like right here. So let me go grab this guy. Let me see if I can grab this. So what, we're, what we have here is that we got this guy now. So we know what the voltage of the 6 ohm is. Why? Because we calculated and we saw that it was 8 volts. So what we're seeing here is that this guy, the voltage of the 6 at 0 plus, from what we already calculated is 0. And just by inspection here, if the voltage of the cap is 8 and the voltage of the 6 is 8, that immediately tells you that the voltage of the inductor must be zero. But let's stick to the KVL. If I stick to the KVL, then you could see here is that the voltage of the cap at zero plus must be the voltage of the inductor at zero plus plus the voltage of the six ohm at zero plus. And you could see that this guy is eight, eight, which then tells us here that the voltage of the inductor at zero plus is zero volts versus the voltage of zero, oops, of zero minus was also zero volts. So in this case, what you're seeing here is that it turns out that that these, uh, how do I say this? This did not change. That's a possibility. What determines it? It's the circuit that determines it. Okay? So I really tried to stress how a switch can change the value, but it doesn't always change it all the time. Okay. Here we go. So this is a tough problem now. Okay? This is a tough problem. Okay, let's go look at this one. Okay, let me grab my example. And this is a, a bit of a wake up call. Okay. So in this example, we have, a, of course, we have steady state at zero minus. I want to determine V1 at zero minus, V1 at zero plus, I2 at zero minus, and zero plus. Okay. So what kind of thinking should I be going through in this process here? So immediately what you should be thinking here is that, so you should be thinking two equations and two unknowns, okay? Two equations and two unknowns. What does that mean here, okay? Ultimately, what this means here is that look at the problem. The problem talks about what? It talks about 
So when I talk about two unknowns, I'm talking about two unknowns. Which unknowns am I talking about? V1 and I2. That, so what this implies here is that I need to use, in general, KCL to relate IL and I2, KVL to relate V1 and V2, okay? I need to write two equations and two unknowns for this thing here. So, okay, so here, so remember, we only care about T equals to zero plus. That's the only thing we care about. But we use zero minus to get VC of zero minus and IL of zero minus. That's what we're interested in. So let's go look at the circuit here. Okay? So when I look at the circuit, what we're going to do here is that IL, excuse me, I1, I2, V1, V2 will depend on the inductor, current, and the voltage of the capacitor. So we need to get those. Yes? Uh, we're using KVL to relate VC to V2 or VL to V2? No, I1 to I2. I because the two that. variables are V1, are V1 and the two variables are related to, if I look at here, the, look at this thing right here. These are the things that we're really looking for right there. So we always have to focus on the two variables that is being asked for. So let's go do this, okay? So if I look at this thing here, I'm gonna look at the initial steady state. Right, so pretty soon, I'm not gonna write initial steady state, I'm just gonna say, what happens at t equal to zero minus? So the first thing that we see here is that the switch is open. So if the switch is open, note that the 80 ohm resistor is gone. Okay, so let's go look at that circuit here. So if I look at the circuit here, what I'm seeing here is that at t equal to zero minus, I got my source. All right, and so what I'm seeing here is that I have my 20 ohm, that's still in the circuit. And then I got my cap, which is an open. And then my inductor is a short. And then I have the other ADO. Right? And then this guy's a, a 20 ohm. There's no 80 ohm. So immediately we can say that I2 of 0 minus is, of course, 0. V2 of zero minus is of course zero because it's, it's a dead resistor. Okay, but we're not interested in that. What we are interested in is what? We want the voltage of the cap and we want the current of the inductor. So you can see that the current of the inductor is the one through the 20 and the 80 ohm resistor. So immediately I'm gonna use Ohm's law, get IL of zero minus. So if you do that, you can see here is that I'm gonna get what? It's gonna be 24 volts divided by 20 plus 80 ohms. And that value of course has to be 100 divided to that. So it's gotta be to four amps, and I now have this guy, which now tells me what that is right there. So I got my first one. So 
I could then see that VC is parallel to the 80 ohm resistor. Okay. I could then see that uh, that the cap is parallel to 80 ohm resistor. So what this means here is that VC of zero minus, which is the same as zero plus, must be the voltage across the 80 ohm, which is of course 80 times the current of the inductor, which then gives me, if I multiply that out, should be about a quarter, should be around 20. My calculator says 19.2 volts. So now I have VC of zero plus. So now I got my two constants. Now the switch closes. Okay. So now we have the switch Uh oh, forgot the, the C. Switch is thrown. Okay, now the switch is thrown, so I put the cap, the inductor, and the 80 ohm resistor back into the circuit. So here I go. So if I look at this, I have this circuit now. I have the 20, I have the cap, I have the inductor, then I have that resistor that looks like this. Okay. So what do I know? I know that this is my 80. I think this is 80. This is 20. And then what you're seeing here is that the, I know what the current is. I, so let me be careful here. So I know this current right here. I'm not gonna put zero plus, and I know this voltage here, but I'm not gonna put zero plus. And then my goal here is to do what? I wanna get this guy. I want this current, and I want this voltage. So looking at this circuit, once again, we need to write two equations, two, for, um, two equations for the two unknowns, V1, I2. So the hint here, take KCL to relate I1, I2. Take KVL to relate V1, V2. That's the kind of thinking you want. Okay? So how do I relate those two currents? So now I'm going to label nodes here. So the first node I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this node right here. That node I'm going to call A. Okay. The only way I can relate I1 and I2 is at node A. So here I go. So I'm going to apply KCL at node A. And you could see here that clearly the current has to be going down like this for I1. Because that's the polarity of the of V1. So if I do that, let's go look at that here. Here I go. I know the direction of the current. So look at that. All the currents in, all the currents out. So this tells me I get IL plus I2 equals I1. And now, so if I manipulate this thing here, I really have I1 minus I2, IL of zero plus. But remember, we already calculated zero plus. Now remember, I1 and I2 
or it is uh, what this guy. Um, they're all at zero plus. I'm going to call this equation one, my KCL equation. Now I got to go relate the voltages here. So when I look at this thing here, what am I seeing here? So now I want to apply KVL. So when you look at the KVL, you can see here is that this guy is going to be the voltage V2 right there. So how, what kind of loop can I take to actually do this? Well, one loop that you could take is you could take the inside loop. Here, let me show you what I mean here. And I think it's worth going through this process a little bit slower here. So when you look at this thing, you may say, okay, what happens if I take this loop right here? So if I take this loop, what I'm doing here, let's say that I go in that direction right here. What you're seeing here is that, look, I'm relating V2, V1. Do I know what VC is? Yes. But what about V20? This is not a good choice because we do not know V20. So what is a good choice? Check this out. If you go around the outside loop, Look what happens. I include the source voltage, which we know. So you could see here is that we're going to apply KVL around outside loop. And when you do that, look at the polarities. I get plus, plus, and then the source is 20. So I'm going to get V1 plus V2 equals 24. Okay, so this is my second equation right here. So let's bring them down, okay? So if I bring them down, I get, I. okay, so the two equations are, I get I1 minus I2 is equal to IL of zero plus, and then I have V1 plus V2, equals 24. What I have to do is that I have to convert. So now what I need to do here is that I must convert. Look what we're trying to solve for. We're trying to solve for what? I2 and V1. We must convert, what did I say? I1? No, we must convert V2 into I2. We must convert I1 into V1 because we are solving for right V1 and I2. The only way I can convert these guys, right, so the thing I got to get rid of here is that I got to get rid of this guy. And I got to get rid of this guy right there. What is it? And I got to get rid of uh, this guy right here. The only way I can do that is Ohm's law. So now what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to apply... Ohm's law to convert them. So here I go. So what you're seeing here is that, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to go I1 minus I2. And then I'm going to say, according to Ohm's law, I1 is the same as V1, but V1 is over 80 ohms. So this becomes... V1 over 80 minus I2 is then IL of zero plus. 
That's one equation. So then if I look at this guy, I'm going to get V1 plus V2. But according to Ohm's law, V2 is then going to be what? Look at 2. It's an 80 ohm resistor, so that has to be 80 I2. So then this becomes V1 plus 80 I2, and that guy equals 24. Look at what I have. I have two equations and two unknowns. So then what do I do? I matrix up the guys, right? So this is going to be 1 over 80, 1 minus 1, 80, um, nope, V1, I2, and then the inductor current was 0 0.24. The voltage source is 24. So what do I do? I do the matrix magic, and this is what I get. So I get that V1 of 0 plus is 21.6 volts. I2 at 0 plus gives me 30 milliamps. And that's how she rolls right there. So, by the way, that's what I call an initial condition. And this one, even though we solved for the initial condition of the capacitor, we didn't use it. It's the equations and how we derive them that really tells us what has to happen here. So I'm done with this chapter, baby. So what do you think? You ready for the quiz on the homework for Wednesday? You got a few of these guys. Okay. So you're going to have to be really paying attention to how you set these guys up. Okay, we step into the abyss on Wednesday. Remember, bring a, I don't know, a little parachute if you have to jump. Okay, I'll see you guys later, okay? Take care. Love you guys.